Hello, everyone. We're about to have the third and I hope final of these pre recorded remote presentations about um, environmental chemistry as I am scheduled to return to Hawaii on the weekend, weather permitting. So this is more organic environmental chemistry, and I appreciate your patience with this remote learning. And as always, if you have questions, please do send them to me by email. Okay, so here's the topic for today. We're gonna to do several different things sort of building on what we discussed last time. We're gonna talk about some classes of organic compounds. We're gonna talk about organic matter as um, ligands and in complexation, something I've mentioned before, but we're gonna get into a little bit more detail now. We'll talk about the acidity produced by organic matter in the environment. And then finally, we'll talk about organic matter transformations by microorganisms, including different types of paths and pathways. Your reading is in chapter 29. And as I mentioned last time, it really should be done with chapters five and 21. And so before we get to those topics, I have a little bit more introductory material to talk to you about first. So I just wanna remind you that for instance, uh, respiring organisms derive the energy to run their metabolisms from organic carbon degradation. It's a fancy way of saying breaking down organic molecules and liberating energy in their bonds. And so whether they're using traditional foodstuffs, things that we think about like sugars, carbohydrates, or other chemicals in the environment that might be contaminants, this is still a strategy to degrade organic carbon and liberate energy. So when we look at aerobic cellular respiration, we find that it easily oxidizes things like uh, glucose. And I've shown you the oxidation reaction there in the middle of the page. And of course, you know, people who like to eat starchy foods know um, aerobic cellular respiration also works with more complex carbohydrates called polysaccharides. And polysaccharides are just multiple sugar molecules linked together in various ways. And I'll define that in a few slides. Now, it turns out that heterotrophic metabolic transformations of natural organic matter in the environment, whether it's dissolved or particulate, generally don't go to completely inorganic forms, meaning to modify stuff all the way to CO2 or something like methane if it's um, a reduced environment. Instead, organic matter is often modified uh, into new molecules, which are released back into the environment or stored in the cell. Uh, different cases can apply. And this is just an example showing you the standard um, sort of uh, aerobic degradation mechanisms via the TCA cycle. Um, and I've just you know zoomed in on one portion of this, but various, it's a schematic obviously, but various, chemicals can be transported across the cell wall and decomposed within cellular structures. And um, this decomposition involves binding to enzymes, as we talked about last time, and generally cleaving and or oxidizing and or transforming in some other way to liberate energy. So this is mediated by enzymes. And many of the things that um, enzymes are involved with are listed on this slide, right? They're involved in the synthesis. They, um, you know, can be uh, bound up by contaminants in the environment, as we mentioned last time. And the key thing about an enzyme is it's just a catalyst of a reaction. It lowers activation energies to affect some transformation. And um, they have very specific molecular geometries that allow them to bind to substrates in the right place and shape to then allow for bond reorganization within the substrate without themselves being consumed. And I have a schematic view of this that is the same slide from last lecture, just to remind you again of, um, in this case, a substrate binding with an enzyme and being cleaved. And in the bottom part of this panel, this you know how an inhibitor molecule, which might have part of the molecule of the same shape, the part that sticks in with the enzyme, but it binds differently and inhibits the um, proper cleavage reaction. There's a little bit more detail about that type of catalysis 
showing you more uh, styles of inhibition, sort of moving from left to right, normal binding, what we call competitive inhibition, which is the example that was on the last slide, non-competitive inhibition. In this case, um, an inhibitor is binding to a different part of the enzyme, but causing it to not be able to act on the substrate. And uncompetitive inhibition, which is shown there in the right. And you can see in that plot at the bottom how each one of these, and this is, you know, again, very schematic, might affect the, you know, rate at which uh, substrates are acted upon. And so you can see the rate of reaction that the normal case there in purple and um, the sort of either a complete um, reduction or the slowing down of um, action on substrate by um, non-competitive and competitive inhibition, respectively. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about polysaccharides. Polysaccharides are polymers of sugar molecules. And you can see a single glucose molecule in the top part of that figure panel. And then you can see with the arrow minus H2O, you've got a whole string of sugar molecules stuck together. And they're stuck together by taking successive molecules and combining them, making an ether bond, which I've highlighted there in blue. These are ethers, right? By taking the OH group of one of these glucose molecules and binding it with the OH of the next one in line. And that condensation reaction takes water out, right? And it, it puts things together. Now you'll notice a subtle distinction between this molecule and this molecule, which is that there's a functional uh, group sticking off this part of the molecule. It's a CH2OH. It's like methanol, right, that's been bound to this carbon here. And in the case of this upper molecule, um, this polysaccharide is a common starch. Each one of those is bound in the up direction. Whereas if you come down here and you look at this structure, you see that it alternates. And in this case here, this molecule is cellulose. Now, just that subtle difference in the combination orientation of this, when we stick them together, you can flip it upside down or um, keep it in the same order, makes a molecule that we have enzymes to digest and ones that we, have en that we don't have enzymes to digest. And both of these uh, synthesis reactions are synthesized by enzymes in organisms that can make polysaccharides, for instance, plants. And I just sort of highlight that uh, group there so you can see it better, in this case, pointing up. Okay, so these are just some more structures of a couple poly polysaccharides, cellulose on top. Um, try to find for yourself the difference between the up and down for that um, kind of methanol group sticking off. And um, then there's also uh, amylose in the bottom, just showing you the polymeric nature of the molecule. So now let's talk about polypeptides. These are polymers of amino acids. And the uh, general structure of an amino acid we talked about last time, you can see it up here, amino acids, um, just like vitamin B that we talked about last time, can form a zwitter ion, which increases its solubility. And um, it's basically the trading of this acidic hydrogen onto this basic nitrogen to make this form. And these are just some of the common amino acids that you've heard of probably. And what I've highlighted in yellow here for you are different R groups. So up here is the generic version and the ones that have specific things in a yellow box are different R groups. Now, just like the taking of an individual saccharide, a monosaccharide to make a polysaccharide, you can also take um, an amino acid and condense uh, into a polypeptide, again, by removing water. And in this case, we're binding the hydroxyl group on the carboxylic acid to um, the nitrogen on another amino acid and pulling out water to make, as we see across the bottom, a polypeptide. Now, another kind of polymer that is, um, is formed slightly differently, but um, very similar type of chemistry involved is DNA. DNA has a couple of strands that wind around each other. 
um, the famous double helix structure. And each strand has a backbone of alternating sugar and phosphate groups. And attached to each one of the sugars is a base, structurally very similar to an amino acid, but not quite an amino acid. And those have the, the famous you know, letters A, C, G, and T with the names shown there. What's interesting is that the way these things are held together to keep that double helix structured is by hydrogen bonds. So rather than polymerizing and condensing, pulling water out, <clears throat> instead, there's a, it's a slightly looser kind of chemistry, which allows DNA to be pulled apart, brought back together, acted upon, and for it to do things within cellular structures while maintaining its primary um, integrity. All right. So that was just a little bit more review. So now we're going to get to our topics. The first topic is um, fate and transport of organic molecules. And as I mentioned last time, this is a huge topic. I just want you to get a feel for some of these important considerations, which we'll be talking about today, which are things like, what is the distribution of organic molecules into the environment? Are they soluble in water or not? Are they volatile or not? And do they degrade or not? And if they do degrade, how do they degrade? So we're going to talk a little bit about each of these things today. And I've just shown you a diagram here from the USGS publication about the Mississippi River, talking about a whole range of processes, which we will get into in a little bit more detail later in the semester, that affect the fate and transport. And I hope you'll pause the slide for a moment and just look at some of the processes, some of which involve distribution and some of which involve degradation. Okay, so for now, we're just going to consider some important classes of molecules. There's more of them in your text. They go, the textbook goes through a whole bunch of different classes, and I'm just going to highlight a few here just to kind of help you think about them a little bit. So we'll talk about hydrocarbons. And remember, we've talked about last time that we can have saturated and unsaturated ones. We can have ring structures, et cetera. So we'll get to them. Then we'll talk about what we call halocarbons, which are halogenated hydrocarbons. Remember, the primary halogens in um, organic molecules tend to be chlorine and fluorine. We do find bromine as well. We do find iodine occasionally, but primarily um, it's uh, chlorine and fluorine, with chlorine being really the big one. And so some of the examples are things like PVC, polyvinyl chloride, chloride uh, PCBs, polychlorinated biphenyls, which we talked about last time, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, such as freon, methyl bromide, and TCE, trichloroethylene. All of these are chemicals we will talk about again. And then we have cyclic ethers and we have organophosphorus compounds. Okay, so let's look at some of these hydrocarbons. This is a special class called a PA. I know there's a lot of abbreviations here, um, and it's, you don't have to memorize them, but you do see these a lot in environmental literature. PA stands for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon. So something I maybe neglected to mention last time is that a single six member ring that's unsaturated, like half of the naphthalene molecule, which we call benzene. I did mention that time last time, but I didn't mention that this is called an aromatic molecule. And it has just nothing to do with um, the aroma. I don't know where the name comes from, but aromatic molecules are um, conjugated, unsaturated ring structures. They don't have to have six members in the ring, but that's a very common kind. So all of the molecules on this page are aromatic molecules. And you can see, you can stick two benzene rings together and you can make naphthalene. You can stick three together and make anthracene. Anthracene is uh, famous because it's the chemical that you find in mothballs. You can also take a seven member ring and a five member ring that are unsaturated, make a beautifully blue colored molecule called agiline. Right. And you can also see, you know, there's different combinations. You can um, put, uh, you know, the three benzene rings together slightly differently and make a slightly different molecule on up into higher and higher order molecules. You might say, oh, why, why are you 
care about these? Well, we care about them because they are commonly found in the combustion products, especially soot, from a lot of different industries. And I've listed some of them there. You know, obviously petroleum burning, you've all been behind a diesel bus. Uh, a lot of the soot that comes off is full of these molecules. But places that you might not realize are, for instance, bakeries, uh, automobiles, coal burning places, forest fires, even a place that uh, flame broils their hamburgers or their steaks, uh, a lot of the, or your home barbecue, whatever, um, you're, it's full of these compounds. And what's interesting about these compounds, they're not very soluble in water, right? And they're, they can tend to make agglomerations, very large particles that, for instance, can embed in your lungs and be very disruptive. And they don't disperse easily because they're not very water soluble. So where we find these, is localized near their sources, for instance, along roadsides. So the next uh, important group of compounds are called BTEX. BTEX is an abbreviation where each letter stands for one of four molecules, benzene, which we've talked about before, toluene, which is this molecule here, it's basically methyl benzene, something called ethyl benzene, which I don't have a picture of, but in ethyl benzene, we've got two carbon atoms here and then xylene. And xylene is three different isomers shown here. It's basically two methyl groups on a benzene ring, and it's a question of whether or not they're next to each other, separated by one carbon, or all the way across from each other. Now, these are produced in very large quantities around the world. They're used in industrial solvents. They're used as starting materials for pesticides and plastics and synthetic fiber manufacturers. They're volatile. They're common in, uh, naturally in crude petroleum and petroleum products, such as gasoline. They're very carcinogenic, but they're not too hard to decompose, much easier than the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons on the last slide. They're found widespread as contaminants. So if you were to get a job as an environmental chemist after you know, getting out of school, um, there's a very good chance you'd be dealing with BTEX contamination. And we have widespread occurrences from leaky underground petroleum storage tanks, spills at petroleum production wells, refineries, pipelines, distribution terminals, you name it. So another category are what we call polychlorinated uh, hydrocarbons. And these can take a whole bunch of different forms. I've just shown you a few examples here, DDT being a famous one. Um, you can see here there's a trichloromethane group. And, or methyl in this case, because it's combined with this carbon. We've got these two chlorobenzenes on either side of this carbon in the center. Because of all of these super uh, electronegative chlorines on this molecule, they're pulling electrons away from this central carbon, which gives it a pos partial positive charge, which allows it to degrade a little bit in the environment. The way it degrades is to make this other molecule called DDT, DDD, I should say, where this chlorine has become a hydrogen. And this molecule is a lot less easy to break down in the environment and more persistent, but it can be further decomposed to something called DDE, which is an unsaturated molecule, which makes this double bond here. We also have this cyclic hexane. Now, these are not double bonds in here. These are single bonds, which makes it a cyclohexane instead of a benzene, but it's also got a bunch of chlorines on it. And this is also something that's common in pesticides. And we have all sorts of other polychlorinated hydrocarbons that I mentioned um, a couple slides ago, things like freon molecules, um, the precursor molecules, vinyl chloride to make PVC. So as I say, these are just some examples. And these are used in a lot of different environments. Recall PCBs, which we talked about last time too, the sort of uh, biphenyl with the various amounts of chlorine on it. So they can be used as pesticides, um, capacitor, dielectrics, flame retardants, paints, adhesives, etc. And many pesticide halocarbons were designed on purpose sort of during the early period of industrial chemistry in the post-World War II era to be volatile, water insoluble, resistant to attack, and easily absorbed by organisms. This is what makes them good as a pesticide. And perhaps in their place of application, they were doing what they're supposed to be doing. The problem is, is when they migrate from that environment and get in elsewhere into the environment and interact with other organisms or build up through food chains, because another thing that these chemicals happen to be is highly fat soluble, 
then they can cause all sorts of uh, other environmental impacts. And so um, to some extent, we've moved away sort of globally as an industry from using these kinds of chemicals as pesticides, but they're still used in a bunch of other processes and are also very um, important class of contaminants to be aware of. So here's another category, cyclic ethers. You know, we've mentioned these briefly last time. Ethers are basically an oxygen with two R groups on either side. What makes a molecule a cyclic ether is if those two R groups are linked together as a single molecule. So the simplest um, type of cyclic ether is oxirane or ethylene oxide. It's a three uh, chemical or three atom ring, I should say. It's got a lot of strain in it. It's not very stable. It's commonly found as an intermediate in the formation of lots of other chemicals. You can see some of them across the bottom here. Uh, but you also see some other cyclic ethers like uh, furan, dioxin. You've probably heard of dioxin, right? So remember in our stick figures, we've got one, two, three, four carbons here, right? So this is a C4O2. And when we look at the um, number of hydrogens that we have present, we um, will find, excuse me, I'm having a little bit difficulty with the mouse here. Um, yeah, there's two hydrogens here, two here, two here, and two here in our stick figure, right? So two, four, six, eight, right? So it's C4HHO2. Here's dildren, a pesticide. Um, it's got, um, it's a combination, right? It's got a cyclic ether on there. It's got an oxirane on there, but it's also got, it's a halogenated hydrocarbon. Um, and you can see some other examples here. These are just ones that are common in um, a lot of environments. Okay, so now another category of molecule here are organophosphorus compounds. These were sort of the next generation of pesticides after the halocarbon pesticides. And again, these were introduced in the 70s and 80s um, after some of the very destructive effects of organochlorine pesticides were discovered. Um, like them, these molecules are also lipophilic, meaning they are fat soluble and accumulated by organisms and into food webs um, because of that. Um, they're also fairly volatile, but somewhat less resistant to attack than organic chlorine compounds, so easier to break down in the environment. Um, they're polyfunctional molecules. Obviously, some of them are more water soluble. Some of them are less water soluble. They can be very retarded in groundwater flow. We'll talk about what that means later, but retardation basically means when a chemical moves in a groundwater flow system slower than the rate of the water. Uh, the organochlorine compounds that we talked about a couple slides ago are generally not retarded in groundwater. And I'm just going to highlight for you here two different categories of organic phosphorus compounds. In one case, we have a phosphonyl. The phosphorus bonded to an oxygen is chemically analogous to a carbonyl, right? A carbon bonded to an oxygen. And this looks very much like an ester molecule in that upper one that I've highlighted with the box. We also have a phosphorus double bonded to a sulfur. I actually don't know the name of what that, that group would be called, but it's like a sulfonyl analogous. A sulfonyl is a carbon double bonded to a sulfur. And so this changes some of the fat solubility uh, properties um, and other uh, chemical properties of these various kinds of molecules. You also see malathion on there in the list, which is one of the most common ones that um, people interact with. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about complexation. We've, we've discussed this before, and I just wanna give you a couple of examples um, about how this complexation works. Remember, we know that a lot of our um, carboxylic acids are ionized to make these kinds of complexes. Um, I've, I've unfortunately lost my mouse, so I can't be pointing to things, but look in the center of the diagram where it says chelation, and you see a carboxylate, a COO minus, binding to a copper, right? And so that, that is a, um, the acid anion of benzoic acid, and copper is bound by this ligand, Right? It's a bidentate ligand because the copper is binding to that O minus as well as the OH. And that chelation greatly increases the solubility of that molecule. If you also look across the bottom, as I mentioned previously before, when we have a chemical moiety, which is just a, a chemical component of a molecule, 
that has a certain behavior, such as a certain pH, to be able to ionize, it doesn't matter if it's on a dissolved chemical or a particle. And so in the very bottom, I've given you the example of an organic molecule interacting with an OH on a clay particle, also forming a complex and allowing that uh, organic molecule to be stuck to the particle. Now, if that's a particle that's floating in the water and then the water settles out, that organic matter is going to be pulled out of the water. Um, or, or it might be in a substrate situation that might allow for the same process of retardation that was mentioning, which makes molecules move more slowly than water flow. Now, if you go up to that top panel, you'll just see um, the rate of dissolution of a few molecules. And the minerals up there, those are all inorganic minerals. Calcite is calcium carbonate. Dolomite is a calcium magnesium carbonate. Um, hematite is an iron oxide. Pyrite is an iron sulfide. Galena is a lead sulfide. Gold in this particular case is shown as the native metal. And you can see the rate of dissolution with either just the right pH of water um, to be in equilibrium with the atmosphere and the amount of CO2 it has. And then next to it, the rate at which this is enhanced by um, adding humic acids, as we talked about last time, the natural organic compounds from the degradation of, of uh, plant matter, uh, either on land or in water. And you can see incredibly high increases there um, by the presence of the organic matter. And that really takes place through this chelation process that is enhancing the solubility and the rate of dissolution. So this is just an example of why that's so important. And just a little note, I think I mentioned this um, previously, but I just want to remind you that we can be chelated uh, or a metal can be chelated by organic matter, whether it's dissolved or particulate. And in flowing water where particulates are suspended, there's really very little difference. But when the flow field changes and water settles and particles settle out, then if a chemical is complex, um, you know, with DOC, it stays dissolved in the water. And if it's um, associated with particulates, then it tends to come out of the water. And we'll talk more about the special category of the hyperfine colloidal particles because certain processes need to take place to help pull them out of the water. And this happens where we have generally mixing of waters of very different compositions, such as fresh water and salt water in an estuary. And that'll be a topic for a later lecture. So there are a ton of different natural organic ligands in the environment, right? Simple organic molecules, complex organic molecules, humic acids, biomolecules, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I, you know, I, I'd like you to just sort of think about this a little bit. Um, there are basically two ways that humans can impact the kind of ligand concentration in an environment, which therefore impacts the fate and transport of things that can be complex by ligands, primarily heavy metals. And so we can find these two categories at the bottom of the slide, natural ligands in non-natural concentrations, like we've enhanced the rate of organic matter production. Think about like a sewage outfall that's just got a lot of human waste product in it. Um, most of the ligands that are in there are natural. They're coming from, from people, but they're in unnatural concentration. Or we can have non-natural ligands, things that we've invented for some purpose that get introduced into the environment and they have some other impact because they're acting as a ligand. In the latter category, th this is described in your book, there is a chemical, I mentioned it once before, a couple of lectures ago, sodium um, nitrilotriacetate, or NTA for short. And you see the molecule there, it's basically like ammonia. Um, sorry, I'm trying to use my mouse and it's still not working. Um, so that center nitrogen in the little uh, graphic in the upper right, if that was had three hydrogen on it, it would be NH3. Instead, it's got three acetates. The nitrogen is bound to the methyl group of the um, acetate. And so again, you can do your little um, testing of your stick figure knowledge to, to show that, that each of those acetate groups, there's one carbon there that's bound to the nitrogen in, in acetic acid or acetate, that would be a CH3. But in this case, those are each CH2s because there's also a bond to nitrogen. So there's a lone pair of electrons on the nitrogen, just like there would be in ammonia. Plus there's three acetate groups. So there's four ways this thing can bind to metals. It's a very effective chelating agent, makes it a quadridentate ligand, especially for lead. 
and as it describes her on a slide in great detail in the book, this is such a strong um, chelating agent for lead that it can suck lead out of pipes. And interestingly, this uh, molecule was not, you know, introduced um, to chelate lead. It was introduced to use as household uh, cleaning agents and industrial cleaning agents, but then it got into waste streams. And um, this is where it, it started to have impact on um, its ability to leach lead from pipes, for instance. Okay, so our next topic has to do with the acidity of organic acids. I've talked about this before a couple of times, so I just want to quantify it now for you. Remember, when we look at a carboxylic acid, that acid can lose the hydrogen and become an acid or a carboxylate anion. In the case of acetic acid, where the R group is methyl, then we have acetic acid going to acetate. In the more generic form, which is shown in the gray box, we have a carboxylic acid going to a carboxylate anion. And so um, I've shown you um, the example of the equilibrium constant for this, for the specific case of acetic acid, which instead of writing out CH3COO minus, I've just abbreviated with AC and AC minus. And so we have an equilibrium constant for that degradation. The acid dissociation constant equals the concentration of conjugate base being acetate times protons divided by the undissociated acid, HAC. We can take the minus log of both sides, and we've done this before in our redox um, discussion. But in this case, when we take the minus log of the equilibrium constant, we call it a pKa. And this gives us the expression in the very bottom, pKa equals minus log of the ratio of the conjugate base to the acid plus the pH. That expression is kind of useful because we can look at the ratio of conjugate base to acid as a function of pH. So for instance, if we look into that expression, and we are at a situation where the pKa equals the pH, they're the same value, then that means that that log of that ratio of the conjugate base to acid has to be zero. And if you remember their algebra of logs, that means that the ratio of conjugate base to acid is one, which is a purely buffered solution. Now, if we go to a situation where the A minus to HA ratio goes up or down by an order of magnitude, we can predict that the pH is an order of magnitude up or down as well. More commonly, how we use this expression is to look at the pH of our water and the pKa of an organic acid and predict from it how ionized it will be, how much of it will be in the A minus form versus the HA form. So I, for instance, give you an example here of an organic acid with a pKa of eight, right? And so at eight, the A minus to HA ratio will be one, but if we go down to pH seven, it's only 0.1, and at pH six, it's 0.01. So obviously as pH drops, this becomes a less and less effective chelating agent because this molecule is much worse at chelating when it's um, in the, un the undissociated acid form than when it's the conjugate base. So if you can kind of look up the pKa of a molecule and know the pH, you'll be able to predict whether or not it's ionized or not. So here I've just shown you a germ plot. And um, just to kind of refresh you from you know, your chemistry, germ plots are basically the plotting of the conjugate base to undissociated acid ratio versus pH. And we're looking at the proportions of things. So this is a plot I, I made uh, in Excel and just using the pKa and slowly changing the pH. And what you find is that there's two domains on this diagram, a domain at low pH where uh, we have the undissociated acid and a domain at high pH where we have the um, uh, conjugate base is associated acid, and there's a place where um, right at pH equals pKa, where the ratio is one, as predicted by the equation that we've been discussing. And the reason I show you this specific acid is because uh, acetic acid has that pH equals pKa point at 4.8, which is pretty similar to the pH, the lowest pH that can be set by uh, CO2 dissolving in water. So if you can remember that point and remember that many other carboxylic acids have a similar pKa, a little bit less oftentimes than um, acetic acid, then we'll note that if the pH is anything above 4.8, that is going to be almost entirely ionized, which means it's gonna be good as a chelating agent and is going to have contributed to hydrogen ion dissolution, therefore partially lowering the pH. 
So many biological carboxylic acids have even lower pKa's, which means that for carboxylic acids in natural waters, they are typically significantly ionized, even at pHs below the lower endpoint of the carbonic acid system, which is 4.3. So what can make them so much better at ionizing? It all has to do with the structure of the molecule, and I don't expect you to memorize this, but if you have any other aspect of the molecule, functionality of the carboxylic acid, um, for instance, and th these rules apply not just to carboxylic acids, but to other chemicals as well, things that are highly electronegative and that can help stabilize the anion that is formed when the acid loses its proton, then that will decrease the pKa. Right now, sometimes you can have conjugation systems, right? Carbon carbon double bonds, those can increase or decrease um, the, uh, the pKa. And so we also have you know, organic acids that have um, higher pKa's than acetic acid and ones that are lower. And um, rather than memorize them, I think it's better to just look them up in a table, which I've done here for you. I'm just not gonna go through every chemical in this table. I've just highlighted a couple things. If you look across the top, you've got acetic acid, which is labeled here as the baseline acid. Now let's look at trifluoroacetic acid, which is to take that carbon, the, the methyl group, and replace each of the hydrogens with the fluorine. Look at how much different the um, pKa is. It goes all the way down to zero, right? So that, remember, uh, pKa's are log units. So that's almost five orders of magnitude. That's almost 100,000 times more acidic. If you look down sort of mid chart, you'll see fluoroacetic acid, where just one of the three hydrogens has been replaced by a fluorine. And that is even um, you know, two log units more acidic than acetic acid, meaning a hundred times more acidic. And you can make the, you can go through this table and look, you can see the cases where chlorine has been put on there or other things and see what their pKa's are. And you'll see that pretty much everything on this table, um, at least for the first acid association, is either more acidic or similar acidity to acetic acid. For instance, all the way down there at the bottom, uh, uh, propionic acid is basically, um, is like acetic acid, but instead of there being a methyl group, there's an ethyl group, two carbons connected to um, the carbon yield. Okay, and then, you know, a butyric acid, which is four carbons, et cetera. Um, again, similar pH. Now look at the effect of adding just one electronegative uh, element, I've highlighted it there, chlorine in alpha, beta, and gamma butyric acid. That's basically being moved farther and farther away from the carboxylate group, the carbon with the carbonyl, and you can see the effect on the pKa. So the farther the chlorine gets, the less difference in acidity we have um, from just regular old butyric acid. And remember that um, chlorine is basically, because of its electronegativity, helping to stabilize to some extent the, um, car the carboxylate ion that's formed when the hydrogen is pulled off. Now, I've also just on this table shown you a bunch of other organic acids that are not based on carboxylic acids and what their pKa's are. And you'll see a lot of them have very high pKa's, which means they're not going to dissociate at all. But if they've got a sulfur or an oxygen or a nitrogen, they can still be chelating agents through their lone pairs if they aren't protonated. Many of those things with very low pKa's um, across the, uh, near the bottom of the table um, that have an oxygen or hydrogen can become uh, protonated and therefore not um, work as chelating agents in the environment. Okay, so another kind of interesting thing to think about with respect to organic matter in the environment is because it takes a charge, and because the solutions need to be charge balanced or electrically neutral, we can have two cases. Let's take a case where there's very little organic matter in the water, let's say an oligotrophic lake. In that case, if we were to sum up the charge of all the cations, it should equal the sum on all the anions that are inorganic because there's no organic matter or very little, right? So we have charge balance, all the minuses and pluses add up. But now let's go to a eutrophic lake where there's a lot of organic matter. And it turns out more organic matter dissolves and makes minus ions or anions than they do cations. So if we were to try to do the balance of our inorganic ions, we would find that there'd be more cations than anions because the um, anions are partly made up of organic ions. 
So we go from this condition without organic matter to this condition in the presence of organic matter. So in general, if we look at the ratio of inorganic anions to organic anions, cations, I should say, the lower that ratio, the higher the DOC content. So this is a really simple way of measuring dissolved organic carbon. We also have to recognize that there are degradation mechanisms that um, can help uh, convert um, organic acids into organic anions and that can contribute to uh, this imbalance. All right, so our last topic today, and it's a little bit um, perhaps more complicated than the others, is thinking a little bit more about microbial transformations to organic matter. Last time we talked about different mechanisms to degrade organic matter, and I mentioned microbial ones on the last slide, said so I would get back to them. That's what we're going to do now. Microbial activity can affect DOC and POC in the environment, and it is therefore an important part of organic matter degradation. In fact, um, microbial transformations form a fundamental part of the carbon cycle, which we you know, all know and love, including the transformation between organic and inorganic forms, as well as um, transformations of one organic form to another organic form for molecules. It also, the fuel for redox reactions that poise the PE of many, many natural systems once we're oxygen limited. Um, it, it can help us, this microbial breakdown with the release of essential nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. Think about um, organic matter sitting in um, a forest region soil, you know, leaf litter or pieces of bark. Uh, they, these contain the building blocks of life that as microorganisms break that material down, they re-liberate, the term we call it is remineralize nitrogen and phosphorus and make them bioavailable again to other photosynthesizing organisms. And finally, microorganisms play a huge role in the breakdown of harmful contaminant compounds, sometimes making them into benign products, but other times taking harmful compounds and making them into other harmful compounds. Think about the example I gave you with um, DDT, DDD and DDE on the halo carbon slide uh, earlier today. Okay, so I'm just gonna summarize some of these um, processes. There's a lot here and I understand it could be a little bit overwhelming, but um, you know, just try to familiarize yourself with some of the names, some of the kinds of transformations, and very importantly, whether the conditions happen in the presence of oxygen, meaning aerobic respiration, or in the absence of oxygen, meaning anaerobic respiration, okay? And we will turn to some specific reactions later um, in the semester, especially week nine. You don't need to memorize the reactions and the names, but some of them are not too hard to sort of figure out what they are. And the better you are at sort of using the lingo and looking at the molecules and kind of understanding a little bit of what's going on, I think the more intuitive it will become for you. So I do kind of want to point out that you, you should try to recognize reactions that are hydrolyses or hydrolyses, I guess is how you say that, you know, which is the adding of water to a molecule or dehydration reactions, which is the taking of water out of a molecule and whether or not degradation reactions represent a reduction and which means it would happen in anaerobic settings or an oxidation, which means it would happen in aerobic settings. So let's talk about um, some very common things that happen during aerobic respiration. These are oxidation reactions. As I talked about last time, an oxidation is an addition reaction. We're adding something onto a molecule. So you can see in the middle of the diagram, there's a straight chain molecule with one, two, three, four, five carbons on it. It's a pentane, and that is reacting with oxygen to make a carboxylic acid, right? The terminal oxygen has been oxidized and water. You can also sometimes make a ketone where the oxygen is added in the center, center of the molecule, and I've highlighted both of these things in blue. So if the hydrocarbon has been oxidized by the addition of water, and we know that oxidation reduction reactions always have two half reactions, what's the reduction? I'll give you a moment to think about it. The reduction is oxygen turning into water. So oxygen is being reduced while the organic molecule is being oxidized. So it turns out that when we do these kinds of transformations to organic matter, um, it's more common that um, 
when we put branching into a molecule, such as that upper molecule, they are less likely to be decomposed by oxidation mechanisms than straight chain molecules. It's just slightly, but so the more branching, the more complexity we put in the molecule, the slower it breaks down. Um, and along these same lines, something called a quaternary carbon, which is a carbon bound to four other things. They don't have to be carbons, but in this example, it's a quaternary carbon bound to four other carbons. Those are very, very difficult um, for microorganisms to degrade. So think about a pool of organic matter, for instance, a spill of unrefined petroleum. It's going to have components in it that are branched and unbranched and quaternary. There's going to be aerial groups in there. And so depending on how long it's been sitting in the environment and acted upon by microorganisms, we're going to end up with a different mixture of chemicals because the easy to degrade chemicals will be degraded away. For instance, the BTEX chemicals that I mentioned before, they're pretty easy to degrade away. And some of the more refractory or difficult chemicals build up in concentration because they are not being degraded away. Okay, so these are just some other microbial transformations of uh, organic matter showing you this mechanism of oxidation. It's got an intermediate of, you know, um, basically adding in the three member ring, which um, can also be called an epoxide. So epoxidation, for instance, the adding of oxygen onto a benzene ring can first go through this epoxide intermediate to make a dicarboxylic acid. And you can see, for instance, the mechanisms of uh, epoxidation of um, naphthalene, two benzene rings stuck together in the middle of the slide and the various things that it can make. It can make these various naphthenols, it can make a diketone, it can make a diol. And, you know, we look at it like this, it looks like a very generic chemical structure, but if a microorganism is doing this, remember this is because the molecule is binding to an enzyme as a substrate and the enzyme is helping to affect this oxidation. And depending on the shape of the molecule and how it binds to the enzyme will determine which uh, one of or combination of these oxidation products we get. Okay, so here's some other classes of reactions. Now these are reductions, okay? And I hope you can look at the molecules and figure that out, that they're, they are reductions when we go from the reactant to the product. For instance, in the very top one, we have an aldehyde, R, C, double bonded O to hydrogen, going to um, R connected to a carbon with two hydrogens and one OH. So from the perspective of that carbon, it's now got two hydrogens on it, that's a reduction. That's a reduction of an aldehyde to an alcohol. Um, you can also see ketone reduction, sulfoxide reduction, et cetera. I'm not gonna read the whole slide for you, but these are types of reactions that are favored in the absence of oxygen. Okay, now here's some other reductive reactions. For instance, if we decarboxylate something, we take a COOH group, a carboxylic acid group off of a molecule and we turn that uh, carbon, that part of the molecule into hydrocarbon and release a carbon dioxide, that is a reduction. There's some other reduction reactions here too, such as taking benzoic acid, which is a carboxylic acid connected to a benzene, adding hydrogen to it. What we're doing is taking the benzene ring, which is unsaturated and saturating it. See how we've lost the double bonds there? And um, we end up with a molecule at the end there, which is, uh, you can see the name there, it's got a carboxylate, it's got a cyclohexane, and it's got a hydroxyl group on it, and um, but it's no longer carbon-carbon double bond. So that is a kind of reaction that would happen in the absence of oxygen. Another kind of important mechanism is dehalogenation in the center of the, of the slide here. That is the removal of a halogen. I talked about that last time. If we um, remove a halogen from a molecule, for instance, breaking down freon in the environment, um, we liberate a halogenated acid. And um, these reactions, as I say, are favored at reductive conditions. And so later when we talk about groundwater, we'll mention permeable reactive barriers, which can often be installed to help make locally reducing conditions intersecting a plume of halogenated hydrocarbon water in the subsurface and allowing it to be broken down into compounds that are easier to decompose in the environment by dehalogenating them. Okay, you can also see finally across the bottom a nitro reduction 
um, which is basically taking that nitrogen and removing oxygens and adding hydrogen. And so these are all um, anaerobic style reactions. Now here's a few more um, oxidative reactions, things that happen in aerobic condition. These are all dealkylations. In this example, the alkyl group is uh, shown in red is a methyl group, one carbon. But you know you could have an ethyl group or a propyl group or any number of carbons you want. It would still be a dealkylation. Now you see the little letter in front of the dealkylation, nitrogen, oxygen, or sulfur dealkylation. The alkyl group is bound in each of these cases to a nitrogen, oxygen, or sulfur. And you see that the end product here is to take the methyl group off, the dealkyl uh, alkylized group turns into formaldehyde. So it has become oxidized. And the thing that it was attached to, nitrogen, oxygen, or sulfur, has been reduced, right? So the in the case of nitrogen dealkylation, we end up with an uh, amine molecule. In the case of oxygen dealkylation, we end up with an alcohol molecule. And in the case of sulfur dealkylation, we end up with a thiol molecule. So here's a couple of other types of oxidative reactions. Remember, oxidative means aerobic respiration. I've highlighted for you the things in red are the things that are being oxidized, and the things in green are the product, the thing they have been oxidized to. Please pause the um, video for a moment and check those things out to make sure you understand what's going on in these reactions. So um, it's also important to note that in nature, we can have a lot of very complicated reactions, some of them mediated by microorganisms, some of them happening on surfaces in the absence of microorganisms. And I've just shown you a couple of mechanisms here for degradation reactions, microbial degradation reactions that are impacted by the presence or absence of iron particles, iron oxyhydroxide particles to be specific. And so you can see in the two boxes, A and B, they're two different things. They are starting on um, the molecule atrazine and breaking it down to um, various products. And so you can see, for instance, in box A, this is a hydrolysis reaction. See, there's a nitrogen connected to, or excuse me, a chlorine connected to a carbon in between two nitrogens in the upper pointing part of that diagram. And if we go um, from left to right at the very top of this slide, you'll see that that chlorine turns into a hydroxide. And the mechanism for that is shown in brackets next to the letter A, how the oxygen addition uh, takes place. So that's a hydrolysis because we have added water to the molecule and liberated some chloride. You can also have a dealkylation. And in this reaction, it's happening to a different part of the molecule. So it's not happening to the chlorine. It's happening where you see the iron oxyhydroxide pointing to, where it says iron oxide surface in the top part of panel B. And so what this does is take that nitrogen that has um, three carbons stuck to it, and you'll see the product of that is a nitrogen with two hydrogens stuck to it instead of one hydrogen. So that is a dealkylation reaction, right? Because we've taken an alkyl group off of the nitrogen, and both of these reactions are enhanced in the presence of iron oxyhydroxide, which means that somehow the binding there is allowing the flow of electrons for these bond reorganizations to take place more easily. It's being catalyzed by those particles. And of course, we have iron oxyhydroxide particles in a lot of places in the environment. So this group turns to that group. That's not a redox, it's a, it, but it's a... Um, hydrolysis. And down here, that group is turning into that group, which uh, represents uh, another transformation, not an oxidation or reduction, just a transformation. Those are Lewis acid base interactions. Okay, so here's another example of manganese uh, uh, oxide as being a strong oxidant during wastewater treatment. So there's two different examples here. There's atrazine in the upper panel, and then there's um, you know four chlorophenol in the bottom panel. So let's look at the upper one. So this is a transformation where this chlorine, which is shown in green, can be removed from the molecule, or as we saw on the last slide, or we can have the dealkylation, which is the removal of the alkyl group from the nitrogen. In this particular example, the um, in this paper, they discuss how 
adding in manganese into wastewater that's got atrazine can help with the dealkylation, the dealkylation that we saw on the last slide, the removal of the carbon groups off that nitrogen. However, if there's naturally phosphate in the water, so PP in this case stands for um, pyrophosphate, which is inorganic phosphorus. If there's inorganic phosphorus in the water, it's going to inhibit that reaction. So if you're treating wastewater, for instance, you need to get the phosphorus out before you add the manganese if you want to enhance this reaction. And in the bottom uh, panel, you can also see um, the process of you know, taking off a chlorine, dechlorination of this chemical, and the fact that that is somehow enhanced by the presence of manganese, whether there's phosphorus or not. So again, there's some sort of Lewis acid, Lewis base interaction here, which is um, some kind of binding between these contaminants and that substrate. And it's helping with the bond reorganization to allow for enhanced breakdown of these chemicals. Okay, and this is just a little bit more about the mechanism of that um, change. And, you know, a process which is discussed in the book, so I want to make sure that you look at it, is beta elimination. This is a way of microorganisms breaking down hydrocarbon side chains by um, sort of slowly pulling off methyl groups. And it happens successively. The more carbons you have, the more iterations we take to basically pull each of the carbons off. Each carbon gets pulled off as a CO2 through several steps. And then we end up with a molecule with one less carbon in its um, in the molecule. Those little arrows that you see represent the flow of electrons and bonds. So that in essence, the first step in a beta elimination is to pull one of the hydrogens off the terminal carbon and to take the electrons from that carbon-hydrogen bond and pass them into a carbon-carbon double bond, um, as is shown off uh, on the sort of uh, set molecule in the center top of the diagram where we've got a carbon-carbon double bond. And this is part of the kind of proposed mechanism of this manganese three mediated decomposition of atrazine. Okay, so here's just some other oxidative reactions, things that happen at um, uh, aerobic conditions, you know, fission of a diphenol uh, molecule into a, uh, where the, the ring is now broken to make a dicarboxylic acid. You can also see the aromatic hydroxylation um, or oxidation where we're adding oxygen to a benzene molecule to make a phenol or a cachetol. And these are things that happen um, both microbially mediated and to some extent um, abiotically in uh, mixtures of materials where we have a lot of benzene, such as petroleum. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about, just, just to get your uh, thinking about this going a little bit, is how hydrocarbons, contaminant hydrocarbons especially, interact with naturally occurring respiration, um, cellular respiration, driven by microorganisms in the environment. The cellular respiration, as we've talked about briefly, and as you probably learned before, is basically taking organic molecules and breaking them down and liberating their energy, passing that through into the um, you know, ADP cycle for storage and so forth. And this is all mediated um, electron transfer and um, you know, oxidation reduction reactions that happen on organic matter through the uh, TCA uh, cycle, or sometimes called the Krebs cycle. And I've, off the side, I've just you know popped in something from Wikipedia in the link. You can remind yourself of the TCA cycle or not. We don't really care about the details of that. I just want you to realize that all the breakdowns that happen in the Krebs cycle are happening because organic molecules are binding the substrates, and then um, the breakdown reaction is being in facilitated, mediated, as is the transfer of electrons. And so we find many organic contaminants in the environment can feed into the Krebs cycle just like um, natural organic contaminant or organic molecules can. And so what is kind of shown here is a sort of a schematic of a hydrocarbon contaminated area where hydrocarbons from um, you know fuel, for instance, they're broken down um, uh, to become oxidized by oxygenases. Those, those are enzymes that, that help with oxidation in microorganisms. And then they're turned into alcohols, things that have chemical components that are similar to sugars. 
that therefore allowed them to feed into the TCA cycle. So even though they're contaminants, they've been oxidized enough inside the organism to then be able to be utilized as a food source. And so microorganisms will break that stuff down. Now, if we're in an oxygen limited environment, such as groundwater that is contaminated with fuel, there can be so much organic matter that we consume all the oxygen. And when we consume the oxygen, we go from aerobic to anaerobic conditions. That's kind of shown by this dashed blue line in the left panel of the diagram. Once we go to um, anaerobic conditions, then we kick into the redox ladder. It's different microorganisms, microorganisms that can use other chemicals as their uh, electron um, yeah, uh, donors to do this um, breakdown of organic matter. And or I should say, excuse me, electron receptors and um, being, you know, things like nitrogen and sulfur and iron and so forth. And so this is the way in which organic contaminants can drive us into um, low redox conditions. And we can still have transformations. But remember, as we talked about a few slides ago, transformations that happen in the presence of oxygen and in the absence of oxygen are oftentimes different. So the kinds of chemicals we'll see being produced will be different in environments where we have hydrocarbon or other organic matter spills that are remain oxidized or go reducing. And this is just um, an example of how a long chain organic uh, hydrocarbon, an alkene, see in the top center of the diagram, can be broken down by the oxidative reactions that feed it into the Krebs cycle. And so look here at this carbon, it's one carbon in from the uh, end of the carbon. Um, it can become oxidized. And so I've just highlighted and read the step of that oxidation. That's one pathway, right? It's not oxidizing the terminal carbon, it's oxidizing one carbon in, and that can feed into the Krebs cycle as shown there at the bottom with the TCA arrow. We can also oxidize the terminal carbon. In that case, we go on a different pathway, right? Where that terminal carbon turns into an alcohol and then a carboxylic acid. And, and in this way, we produce new hydrocarbons that are smaller. We produce oxidized organic matter and we can produce some gases um, if these reactions go you know, fully to completion where the, those carboxylates are liberated to CO2. So this can have a whole bunch of different uh, impacts in the environment, including um, you know, reactions that are um, potentially produce toxic chemicals because of the metabolites of this process. They can increase organic matter in the environment by taking long chain organics and making them into smaller chain organics, which might be more soluble or more easy to distribute in the environment. Um, they can produce gases which will clog pores. So again, in the subsurface, they might impede the flow of water or make gas bubbles or change other physical properties. And we will talk about these kinds of things again later in the semester when we talk about groundwater. But I did want you to start thinking about all of these kinds of transformations and see how they work. There's really pretty simple co concepts associated with a diagram like this, even though it looks really complicated, each one of the things that we just walked through are various aspects of the chemistry that we talked about in the preceding slides today. All right, so I will leave it there and thank you for your attention.